Hey, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, uh, I guess, depending on where you are. Um, super excited to get into today's uh, topic. We're going to be looking at um, how entertainment and sports is driving uh, really the, like local economies. Sort of, it's such an interesting topic. And, and for those of you who've been following other places or webinars, looking at professional sports, some of our white papers of recent, looking at college sports. Um, our research department, Carolyn, is actually speaking, I think, tomorrow on a similar subject up in Northern California. You know, basically, as, as everyone knows, uh, uh, Placer is identifying the data and the insights into local establishments, uh, as well as regions and markets. And we're doing that based on a combination of foot traffic data and then overlaying that data on a whole wide range of, of uh, data sets to reveal some just uh, fascinating information about who's going where and how long they're spending and where else they're going. In the age of remote work, which is really the uh, underpinning for almost every massive shift to local economies right now, we've seen that employees are coming to the office less, which is having a massive impact on local economies, right? Fewer visits to services, fewer visits to restaurants, fewer visits to transit. Um, so one of the most uh, optimistic data points that's also coming up these days is how while people may be staying home more often to work, they're coming out more and more and more for entertainment, for shopping, for uh, concerts, for sports, right? It's as though the sort of um, when humans start to interact less with each other for one reason, they find a way to make up for it uh, in another venue. And that venue uh, has been uh, what we're going to look at today, at least, is how that venue is uh, entertainment settings. And I'm, I'm super excited uh, for today's webinar. And um, we're actually going to be joined by a couple of just uh, total experts and yet uh, very different experts um, in terms of their expertise. Right. So uh, on I'm going to I'm going to actually unmute uh, um, uh, Graham right now. So on the line right now is uh, Graham Gee. And Graham is actually a research manager with Visit California, which is the statewide organization in the, you know, uh, on the planet's eighth largest economy, uh, responsible for not only driving tourism, right? And that's everything from uh, local tourism, domestic tourism, international tourism, to uh, all the different attractions, all the different cities, all the different beaches and the mountains and everything that you think of when you think of California, but also uh, Graham's uh, responsibility is to measure the impact of a lot of what that tourism brings, right? Whether it's overnights or dollars in, 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 into local businesses. So thrilled to have Graham on. And we're also uh, from the other coast going to be joined by David Joyner. And David is uh, a completely different type of expert in the space. Um, David is the uh, president and manager of a sports facilities uh, um, establishment in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And it's an event center. It's 75,000 square feet. It has, I guess, eight basketball courts and maybe 16 volleyball courts. And he's part of a network called the Sports Facilities Companies. And I was uh, first introduced to David a few weeks, well, excuse me, a few months ago at a, a meeting of city and county managers from across the country. We were in Austin together. And I listened to David speak about how his company is working with uh, cities and counties across the country. And what they're able to do is um, not only partner with cities and counties across the country, but establish these fantastic uh, event centers, these sports facilities, uh, event centers. And I'm going to show some data about how visitors to not only David Center in Rocky Mount, but some of the other centers that he and his company, Sports Facilities, are operating, has this tremendously powerful impact on uh, the local economy. And we're going to dive into that too. So again, really thrilled to be joined by both Graham from Visit California, as well as David, uh, who's, who's speaking with us today from Rocky Mount. We're super thrilled to have both of them. Um, so uh, just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. So um, I'll get through these introductory comments in just a minute or two. And then I'm going to turn to David, who is uh, just an expert on how uh, 
um, his company is not only drawing uh, visitors, and I'm going to show you some data about just the impact of those visitors, but also specifically around youth sports. And I thought this would be an interesting topic because, you know, at Placer, we're working with, I guess, seven, almost 800 now cities, counties, uh, marketing organizations, DMOs, EDOs, and youth sports in the last maybe two to three years has just seen this massive uptick in terms of not only participation, but also the curiosity coming out of the civic space about how to take advantage of this demand, right? We hear about pickleball with the adults, but youth sports is a massive driver of local economics. And David is just a perfect expert to chat about that. So uh, then we're going to get talk about what we call the concert lift. Um, for those of you who uh, haven't had your head in the sand. Everybody knows that Taylor Swift and Beyonce were uh, making their way across the country, sweeping across the nation. And uh, Graham has some really cool data to share about how those events were um, amazing draws, uh, which should come as no surprise, but specifically uh, how they differ in terms of uh, where visitors come from, where they stayed overnight, which local businesses they visited, and how the local economies are benefiting from that. Um, okay. So uh, just a quick 30 second introduction to Placer. I, I'm sure most of you all who are familiar uh, with our data will find this as a bit of a refresher. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, uh, Placer is built on uh, data that is observed from the movement of mobile devices, right? So the latitude and longitude of, of, of tens of millions of mobile devices moving across the country. And then we analyze that data um, to provide insights. And those insights come in the form of you know, visitation insights, demographic insights, all sorts of metrics that provide insights to a wide range of users. So those are our civic customers, uh, people in entertainment and leisure and aviation and commercial real estate and finance and retail, um, all of whom are finding great value from understanding uh, very highly accurate data about visitation metrics. And of our almost 3,000 um, clients right now, as I mentioned, about 700 of them are cities and counties and economic development organizations, domestic marketing, excuse me, um, destination marketing organizations, uh, universities and downtowns. And that's why we thought some of the subject matter that we're going to discuss today will help you all uh, tell the full story of your location. So uh, as I mentioned, thrilled to have David on the line. David, I'm going to tee up with a, a quick question. So David, as I mentioned, and I might get the details a little bit, not exact, but basically uh, is a president and, and, and runs the operations, day-to-day -day operations of the Rocky Mountains Event Center, Rocky Mountain Event Center. And this is part of the sports facilities company's uh, portfolio of, of centers. And this, this location in particular just has extraordinary impact, which I'll show you shortly. Um, but you know what, actually, before I dive in, David, can you give a quick introduction to sort of yourself and your role at Rocky Mount and just a little overview as to how your company is partnering with both cities and counties? Because I know that's a big part of what you do to make these centers happen um, from inception all the way to cutting the ribbon. And then I'd love to dive into some data uh, for some of your specific events. Sure. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm my technical title is the general manager of the Rocky Mountain Event Center. Uh, the president might be better for my pay. Uh, I'll take that. <laughs> um, I, we are 165,000 square feet that is sits in the downtown of Rocky Mount. Uh, we were a economic development project that the city did to boost tourism, especially downtown development. So it wasn't just they wanted sports tourism, they also wanted to boost uh, the development and their and as a part of their comprehensive plan for downtown development. Uh, we are unique in that we're a city split between two counties. So I have to work with uh, the city of Rocky Mountain who owns the building that we manage uh, it for them, our the sports facility company's Rocky Mountain team, as well as the county uh, leadership in Nash County, as well as the county leadership in Edgecombe County, since our city straddles both of those counties. Uh, we work with them, um, you know, the hotels, for example, that a majority of our guests stay in are in Nash County. Uh, we actually sit, though, however, in Edgecombe County. So we work with both tourism offices uh, and as far as how we reach out to the restaurants, how we engage with their uh, small business destinations that might be popular in the area that our guests are going to frequent. Uh, so we have a very, I would say, comprehensive ground game on how we engage with the community, because if we don't do that, our guests aren't going to have a great experience, no matter how great the facility is. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so now... Uh... Yeah, as I think I mentioned um, to those, but since there are so many folks who just joined recently, you know, I first heard David speak just recently at an event I, in, in Texas, I think it was a city county managers and association, and he's just in a, a wealth of knowledge, not only about his center, which we'll get into, but also about really how 
uh, cities and counties are leveraging these opportunities to attract more people uh, to their location. So I'm going to put David on the spot a little bit. So here, I, I thought I'd take a look at one of your events. And the first one I looked at, just to get us underway, David, is you, you all mm -hmm. did a big shots uh, basketball tournament. It was back in May. And I pulled yeah. some Pulitzer data for it the other day. And, and I just want to bring to everybody's attention the impact of, of these events. Uh, for, over the course of two days, uh, David Center, uh, or his general manager, not president, apologize, uh, saw about 13,500 visits over two days. Now, this is in a city that has a population of 55,000 people. OK, so just put that together for a second. You're talking about 13,000 visits in two days with a city of, uh, of 55,000 people. Now, what's interesting, looking at the data uh, for who the visitors are, leveraging placer data, I can uh, see that a benchmark against the state of North Carolina, which has an average house median income level of $55,000, uh, David is drawing $61,000 household income, uh, median uh, household income families to his center, right? Who also have a higher education level benchmarked against the state um, and are actually coming, as you can see in the percentage of visitors that it skews heavily towards uh, those with, with, with higher incomes. Not only that, but the Big Shots tournament, just these two days, when we look at the home locations of the visitors to this tournament, you can see that this isn't just a local draw, but the tournament at the Rocky Mount Event Center is actually drawing the majority of the visitors from outside of 30 miles away, right? And you can see that, right, from Wilmington on the coast all the way to Atlanta, people up in Roanoke and, and actually making their way up into the D.C. It looks like one or two coming out of New Jersey, my home state as well. So, David, how is it that this center in a city of 55, 54,000 people is drawing 13,000 families, 13,000 visits uh, on a just sort of one weekend in May. And I mean, what a tremendous regional asset. Yeah, and so uh, one, thank you for for pointing that data out. We're really proud of it. Uh, a lot of it is we we go after these events. We are we can be 16 volleyball courts and eight basketball courts. Big Shots is one of our biggest partners. And to your uh, point, they come from all over. You know, they travel in, we market heavily on the experience they're going to have in the area, as well as we have to run a very successful tournament when they get here. But that was the goal, that these people come in, uh, they stay in our hotels, they shop at our restaurants, they visit our retail shops, uh, and they loot, a lot of them come in on Fridays. Friday is the load-in day for the tournaments. They stay uh, Friday night, Saturday night. Uh, some of them say Sunday night. So this is And this is continuous for us from January to June. We start tournament season in January. Uh, we usually end June or sometimes in July, depending on it. But, but this has been a, a very continuous thing for us, and we've only seen the numbers of the teams grow. You get that amount of people by having tournaments that parents like to come to. The more yeah. parents like to come to it, the more teams you have. So, so what is it about Rocky Mount that made this a perfect location to for this success story, right? What is it about the local economy or the local the mix of businesses? Or what was it about Rocky Mount? I mean, I know you all have uh, facilities and centers all over the country. And we've, I'm going to show you yeah. some of the data I've indexed them. But somehow this one just seems to be outperforming. How is that? Part of it is our ge geography, uh, you know, location is everything, as you know, in real estate. And so where we sit off of I-95, we are technically the halfway point on 95 between New York and Florida. Uh, so we're an easy drive, even for people from out of town or people flying in. Uh, the Raleigh Dorm Airport is only 45 minutes away from us. And so our location makes it easy for families to get to where they don't have to spend a ton of time on the road, but it's still far enough that they're going to stay in the hotels. So that also has created a hospitality culture in this area where our businesses and hotels know how to service the guests. They're used to servicing people from out of town. So what I tell people is though we are working from an economic development strategy on building the city to be known as a destination uh, uh, in a way that smaller communities aren't, we get destination traffic currently. And so that's a real uh, yeah. caveat for us. So we're already getting that traffic. Uh, so what our job is to do is how we leverage that traffic and keep them coming and create a longer experience and extend their room nights. Yeah, this, so so it's funny you should mention that. So, so here's a little snapshot, and you may have this data already, Dave, but I wanna sort of reveal it to you about who is actually attending uh, that even just that tournament in general. So based on the home locations of the devices that we observe in your center uh, across just those days, and and uh, 
I think the way we index it, I just looked at the Friday and Saturday. So this won't include the people, as you point out, who stay Sunday and pour into mm -hmm. even more into the local economy. But what was interesting is you're heavily over indexing for uh, what uh, the folks at Spatial AI, which is a, a segmenting company, right, that observes everything from online behavior and consumer behavior and starts to group um, into these um you know, they, they give names to these uh, sort of segments based on behaviors, right? You're way over indexing for the, the flourishing fusion families, the upper suburban diverse families, uh, households that have incomes basically between 100 and 150 thousand uh, dollars on average that are coming for just this for into, you know, into a city that has a median household income of forty six thousand dollars, right? So either double or triple are based on so 13,000 people with approximately double or triple the income and therefore the, the discretionary, the spendable income as the, the base, all right? The people inside who are residents of the community, right? And looking at that one step further, this is kind of fun. And again, this is just based on some of the data that we, uh, uh, you know, um, draw inside of Placer. Uh, some of these families, just to give you a demographic snapshot, 38% uh, of which have children, home ownership at like 77%. 40% uh, with a college degree or better. Um, uh, and I, I just have to read this. This is just too much fun. Uh, fashionable, uh, who have brands like uh, Armani, Versace, Foot Locker, right? Uh, find them reading SN75, visiting websites like World Star, Hip Hop, Indie Wire, using Instagram, WhatsApp, right? These are hip folks coming to these tournaments, right? Uh, uh, people who are on the Oprah Winfrey Network and hashtag things like Wakanda Forever, Dreams, Rock the Vote. Uh, Black Lives Matter. So you're bringing not only uh, a diversity of people, but people who have money to spend, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's who you're drawing into the community. And these are some of the stores where they actually spend their money. But I thought it'd be fun to look specifically at where the people who were in town, May 27 and 28, where they were going and spending money, right? So this is a map of how folks that are coming to a youth basketball tournament, right? are actually spending money all over the city and all over the county, driving revenue uh, as part of their visit, right? So the Chick-fil-A, the Zaxby's, Buffalo Wild Rings, Wings, right? And then you look at where they're staying, Doubletree by Hilton, um, Country Inn and Suites, and Fairfield. And we're going to get to Fairfield in a second, Fairfield Inn, which is, if they're not sending you uh, uh, beautiful Christmas presents every year, I'll show you why they should be, <laughs> um, even Outback Steakhouse, right? So mm -hmm. these are the local, This is, by the way, this is just the top 10. Right. Of mm -hmm. course, because I wanted it to fit on a slide. But I took a look at like hundreds of local businesses that are getting uh, getting revenue right from the people who are just attracted to this tournament. And again, let's look at those people for a second. The folks that are attending these tournaments that you're throwing tend to over index compared to the uh, the state. Uh -huh. significantly for people who spend money out and away from home on, you know, uh, spend money on lunch and dinner, uh, spend for food out of town, right? They over-index for people who spend money on fees for entertainment, go do sports, obviously, recreational stuff, play theater, opera. So it's not just the revenue inside the restaurants, but these are doers, right? These are spenders and these are doers who are coming to your tournament. Now, just because it's so much fun, uh, I thought I'd show you the the actual prior and post of just this tournament, David. Before mm -hmm. going to the tournament, 4% of your 13,000 visits came from the Fairfield Inn, right? That's mm -hmm. pretty good, right? 400 some odd people, mm -hmm. right? And after they visited your center, right? Uh, a bunch of them went over to Chick-fil-A to eat. Some went right back to the hotel. Some went to Buffalo Wild Wings, et cetera. Look at this. Zaxby's is doing $2.7 million of business, right? Now, mm -hmm. the state of North Carolina has sales tax, I believe, around 4.75%, right? The county's getting 2.2 of that. So just look at these numbers. These are some of the numbers that uh, uh, David's event center are driving into the local economy. I want to turn it over to you, David. Are y'all measuring in any way these sorts of KPIs? Are you getting, is the county turning around to you quarterly and saying, hey, this is how we think you're contributing? Do you have a way of currently looking at this? And, and you know, how do the folks who are, you, you know, making this happen, like you are, how are you measuring these impacts to your local economy? So that's a great question. We have a formula that the county uses for their uh, economic impact. 
so that we can judge, you know, kind of that visitor spin and uh, the occupancy. One, well, obviously, we they have the occupancy tax numbers that they can look at, but then just in the general economic impact for those particular weekends, uh, it is not as detailed as this. Um, but we, so we don't, so we don't see this kind of breakdown. We we know from our internal uh, measurements, for example, like everything you're saying is lining up perfectly with the demographics of our basketball attendees. Um, it would be different restaurants, say for our volleyball attendees. Uh, you know, and so, uh, but the like, especially the hotels, the, the restaurants you frequent, the, the amount that they spend. Uh, this this is very interesting to see how that lines up with our economic general impact. But this is a lot more detailed than we're used to saying. I think I was muted there. You know, I think it's it's just fascinating when we think of youth sports, when we think of entertainment, right? I think many of us, and I come from an economic development background as well. Uh, many, 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 many years ago, uh, when we do this sort of work, we often think of, you know, the economic development as all the effort it takes to make things like this happen, to bring Sports Facility Center to Rocky Mount, all the years of planning that go into it, all of the effort and the politics and the funding and the all of that goes into it. And then it's often the case that we sort of cut the ribbon and hope for the best. I think David's center is proof uh, it, it, one of the greatest examples of proof about not only how the, uh, you might say the primary KPI of visitor spend, but now let's look at, you could look at some of the induced um, growth, right? That directly results from this. And I'm going to give you an example. If you look at Rocky Mount Event Center, right? And we mentioned that 4% of the people are going direct, directly to the Fairfield, right? And then after leaving the Fairfield, 9% of the people who are leaving the Fairfield in right, went directly to the Rocky Mount Event Center, right? Now, what's interesting about that, okay, is that you start to look at all of the different, a number of different centers, right, that uh, uh, for sports facilities, you're going to see these similar, I, I looked at a few different, I looked at one in New Jersey, uh, over at, in Texas, and in New Mexico, and you're going to see that all of these centers are actually over-indexing in terms of uh, the people that are coming to visit these centers tend to have far more uh, household income and do far more spending out of the home than uh, the local residents. So, so these assets, these economic development assets are really not only, they're paying for themselves right away. And not only are they paying for themselves, but they have a multiplier effect. And that's what I want to talk about right now, which is if you look at the plan development, all right, this is a placer uh, uh a place a report for planned development in the area, you're going to see, you're going to see spinoff, right? So it sounds like Nash County is building a field house, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that that is because of your success in some degree, they're expanding on these opportunities to, because youth, youth uh, uh, sports and youth sports tourism. I also see that Fairfield is actually constructing another hotel down the road or as permits to do so. So David, tell us about, the 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 development that you're seeing inside of Nash County and how that's related to you sports or just sports entertainment in general. How is the how is the local economy just simply expanding on all sides on this topic? So we've seen a great deal of growth in small businesses, and I'll say I'll start just in downtown Rocky Mountain, both the Nash and Nashcombe side. Uh, we've seen uh, new businesses open up. We've seen new investors come in, buying buildings. To renovate them, um, we the number of hoteliers, uh, planning developers that I've had to tour the facility to that have came in from one economic developer or the downtown developer or just private uh, developers who wanted to come in for a tour is it, constant. Uh, this the city has made additional investments uh, because of that. So some of the things that you pointed out, we're seeing both at the city and county level. Uh, and, but I'll, I'll give you another example uh, that's more of an anecdotal, but it's the normal. I was just in a coffee shop recently with one of our prominent uh, small business owners who owns a, a number of eateries in town, came up to me and said they were working on a new project. As soon as it started the year, he wanted to come to us to talk about marketing in the facility because he needed that business. He was like, they couldn't handle the amount that we give them now. And so they're expanding into a new space. So we're seeing a continuous amount of that growth. And now the city... Uh, spending additional money, trying to leverage it with new assets to help us, one, continue growing it, uh, but to create a better experience that we can capture even more business. Yeah, super, super impressive stuff. And, and you know, again, it, it's it's interesting, you know, there's always, I, I just say this from some experience, like there's, there's always a lot of um, risk 
in building these massive investments. And I certainly don't know what went into building your center. But when you start to look at the data of the regional draw, and again, I just picked one weekend in May and you see mm -hmm. 13 and a half thousand visits to a city of 54,000 people over indexing by 50% on the, in, on the median household income levels and the spend in local restaurants and local hotels. It's just hard to believe that youth sports in general isn't one of the greatest untapped opportunities, I think, for uh, local economic development in the nation. Is the industry of youth sports expanding? I mean, your company does a lot of work across the country. Is this just becoming one of uh, uh, like the great new economic development assets? Uh, absolutely. Uh, to say the least, it is a competitive race now that cities and counties across the country are actively having meetings, having feasibility studies conducted, uh, and are building these facilities. We, case in point, yesterday we held an event here with state and economic development leaders and local government leaders from across the state, literally from the mountains to the coast, using the Rocky Mountain Event Center as an example, and all of them asking questions, talking about how they did it, and everybody's trying to do it based on what their market is. So you're seeing a lot of outdoor complexes being built, but a lot of people looking at this model because of the versatility of our space that we're not pigeonholed into one thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're seeing a ton of growth. It, it is becoming extremely competitive. That's great. It, 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 and it's just so impressive. You know, I, I have a bunch more questions for David, but I, I want to pivot the conversation briefly uh, over to Graham. And Graham is a on the other coast and mm -hmm. has a very different uh, responsibility than David. Graham is looking statewide at data in California to understand how enter every all forms of entertainment and tourism are, are impacting local economies. He's a research manager with the Visit California, which is, uh, for those of you who weren't on, on the call for the first couple of minutes of the intro, uh, it's a statewide organization really responsible for marketing the state to the world. I think it's probably the easiest way to do it. And Graham's in charge of, of uh, pulling the data that uh, either uh, justifies uh, the last spend and strategizes the future spend. But uh, it's too much fun right now um, when these sorts of concerts are sweeping through the nation. And so I'm just going to uh, uh, tee Graham up, if you will, the Taylor Swift and Beyonce tours. Now, I uh, did not attend either of the shows, um, but I have some friends who did, and I and they threw down uh, more money than I've ever thrown down at a live concert times 10. And they came back saying they would do it again tomorrow. Um, it was incredible from what I understand. Now, eight tour dates for Taylor. I'll say Taylor Swift. I don't know her personally. So eight tour dates <laughs> for Taylor Swift in California, four new tour dates for Beyonce. What I thought we could do is look at SoFi Stadium, right, where they overlapped. And in doing so, I want to remember back in 2009, I think it was 2009, was it the MTV Awards? I can't remember exactly. And Kanye jumped up on stage during Taylor's award. And I mean, maybe it was, uh, I can't remember exactly which award show it was. You all maybe remember. And basically took the mic and said, you know, Taylor, you may have had a great album. Beyonce had the best album of the year. So it, it feels like he started this, uh, uh, Taylor versus Beyonce. And I'm going to put some data out just to perpetuate it uh, and, and, and put Graham right in the middle of the fire. So, so Graham, your role, as I mentioned, is to help the state of California understand the importance of live events uh, as part of your responsibility, right? Understand the impact, help them figure out how to market those events. Um, so let's look at some of the data. SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles, right? Taylor was there for a couple of days earlier this year in August and saw 145,000 visits, right? Now, Beyonce was also there, so 75,000 visits, right? Um, and of course, visitors, pretty much the same number because people are going once, right? Unless you're truly fortunate and going multiple times. So let's just start with a quick look at who these folks are that are coming to these events, right? So the Taylor Swift show pulling from locations with an $87,000 uh, median household income, Beyonce pulling a $71,000 median household income. But note, Beyonce's, ten, Beyonce's show tends to draw folks who are more local, right? They, they're more localized to LA, especially the, the center city of LA, which makes a lot of sense when you start to look at the map, which I'll show in a second. So um, one more comment on overall visitation. It looks like a lot of the folks coming to the Taylor Swift show are coming from out of state. In fact, under uh, you only had at, well, half of the folks, excuse me, were coming from locations north of 50 miles away from SoFi Stadium, whereas Beyonce's show was drawing people again from all over the nation, but it was really about uh, uh, much people who were much closer to home, 
right, to a higher degree. So um, especially just looking at uh, the home locations, this is location by zip code is one of the reports inside a placer or visitation origin by zip code. Graham, tell us a little bit about why you were looking so closely at the home locations for visitors to these big events and how that ultimately influences uh, what you do. Sure. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and, and good morning. Um, it, it's really kind of a new area for Visit California. Not that live events are new, but I mean, in terms of our, we're, we're a marketing organization. We're entirely, we're a little bit unique as a DMO. We're entirely funded by the industry, by hotels, rental cars, retail, restaurants, transportation, attractions. Um, and we're really kind of high funnel marketing. So in terms of live events, which is is really kind of destination level, you know, it's it's a little bit different. That's not really core to our marketing, but certainly to our stakeholders and, and industry partners, it, it's incredibly important and important for us to understand better because we know it is, you know, a, a destination driver. People are are coming to these events, as you've just noted, with particularly with the Taylor Swift shows coming from out of state. I think about 15% out of state for the Taylor shows, Taylor Swift shows. And so particularly for knowing for, for California that um, people that are coming from out, visitors that are coming from outside of the state are likely to stay longer, to spend more, particularly those coming from non-drive states. Um, we're seeing, you know, the average spend in California on a trip is $2,500. We know that those coming from further distance that are flying in are staying longer and spending more. And so we, we know that there are events that, that can be, you know, really critical to the, the California tourism industry, to our, to our industry stakeholders. So we're, we're kind of new to this and really we're, we're using this data, the, the placer data to, to understand the industry better and really to, to develop a framework to help us understand where we play in this business. It's, it's, you know, we, we don't have a strategy currently, but this is really going to help inform uh, a framework for us to to work with this. Oh, you're okay, speaking of playing in the space, yeah, I've muted myself. Um, so if you look at the overlap of, of how Taylor Swift and Beyonce draw, right, and then you take it one step further, right, and you start to look at uh, where people were directly before they went to the event and directly after the event, you can start to get a sense of which categories are benefiting most from these visits, right? And these visitors. So if you look at the Taylor Swift show, right? Um, and by the way, we're only looking at the stadium. I made sure to exclude the parking because uh, a lot of these shows have a huge tailgate phenomena that are going on, but I just wanted to capture the people inside the building. Um, we have a, we have somebody in our uh, our team, Carolyn, who is looking at the tailgaters for some of the big college uh, football games and it's incredible how much of an economy happens outside of the walls of the ballparks. But let's get getting back to the Taylor Swift show. So 32% uh, of folks uh, came from their home location, whereas 15% are coming from local hotels, uh, other attractions, restaurants, and fast foods are benefiting, right? Now, oh, this is, a, and this, by the way, and this isn't just in California, this we saw across the country looking at uh, Taylor Swift. In fact, if you look at, this is an index of five of the hotels in LA, sort of between SoFi and the airport, right? And if you look at the data for these, you can really see the Swift lift, um, as it were, right there in early August, right? With just a massive jump of folks who are coming into town and staying at hotels. So from your research, uh, speak a little bit about the impact just to the hotel economy, if you can, for some of these bigger concerts and events throughout the state. Sure, yeah. I mean, our part, our one of our data partners, CoStar, has done some analysis on the Taylor Swift shows and estimated a two hundred million dollar revenue impact um, for the fifty plus states. Just in overnight, had. just in just in overnights. Yeah. So. Um, and then what's the what's the TOT tax. tax in California? Quick math. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of money. <laughs> It's a lot of money. And, you know, when we looked specifically at Los Angeles, I mean, we, we definitely saw a bump. Um, this is, I think, um, you're showing the, the LA airport region within Los Angeles County, uh, which we looked at for the month of August, um, which particularly, you know, we saw this, this ADR lift 15% uh, for the month year over year. Um, and compared to the county and, and really to the state as a whole was, was incredible. We have, we track about 80 regions and destinations within California and that LA port, airport region near the stadium uh, had the largest year-over-year -year lift uh, of any of the, the 80 destinations that we track. Um, and for us, I mean, 
you know, I really, you know, with with the Taylor Swift and Beyonce uh, concert tours, we, you know, our play was really on in in our own channel space. We uh, published, I think, two articles related to the tours and had some Instagram posts. And it was really to to kind of highlight, you know, not so much come to the shows, but if you're coming to the shows, here's some potential other, you know, itineraries to consider. Here are hotels that you might consider booking at or restaurants or shops. Um, and really to kind of help consumer and help our stakeholders, um, you know, kind of take advantage of that incredible opportunity. Yeah, the concert goers um, uh, are, you know, obviously people will fly for a concert, right? But you have a whole concept. And this is kind of interesting because it relates to what David's work is when he's, he talks about, you know, these um, uh, these uh, sort of holistic marketing opportunities where, look, you have an event, right? Or what you guys call, I think of as a California, you say a trip as motivator, Right. And you could think of like youth basketball tournament as a motivator, but you have an event. And then the question is, how do you expand on that event to go 2x, 3x, 10x in terms of driving impact to the local economy? And I, you, you did some research recently. Um, and I, I'd love for you to speak a little bit to this concept of Visit, Cal of Visit California is exploring, which is you refer to as uh, event as trip motivator. Yeah. Yeah, really what we do is we we ask about trips, like the types of event, you know, types of activities, events that they um, attended on a trip. And then, you know, what uh, was it a top motivator for that trip? And what we found in our recent research, like, for example, concerts, 31% um, of uh, domestic travelers had said they had uh, attended a concert on a leisure trip in the past uh, two years. Um, and that net was, you know, in terms of motivation, 20% of domestic travelers had said um, a concert was a, a top motivator for that trip. And on average, those trips were 2.1 nights. Um, similar, just slightly lower figures for music festivals and professional sporting events. Um, you can see professional sporting events had a higher average trip night. Um, so those, um, those, can, those travelers were staying a little bit longer in, in the space. Now, these numbers, they did seem a little bit high to us. Um, I, I think we're kind of coming out of a unique situation where, you know, coming out of the pandemic, people are really engaged in, in kind of these types of experiences that bring people together, kind of what we call, we have a trip motivation segment called YOLO, where people, you know, you only live once, that people are really just, uh, you know, investing in these trips to, to have these really kind of special experiences. And so, you know, and with the Beyonce and Taylor Swift shows, I mean, I, th I think these numbers are probably a little bit elevated this year, but clearly this this is, you know, a ph phenomenon and that we're seeing in terms of the travel industry. Yeah, no doubt. In fact, if you look at, here's some, I loved this, uh, this data. <laughs> if you look at like, um, the sort of who's drawing what visitor, right? And again, these are these are segmented groups from from uh, spatial. And it's based on you know uh, sort of an assemblage of uh, devices coming from a certain home location, as well as all of the habits, the online habits, and else elsewhere. You see that you can see uh, they're both way over indexing, right? For educated urbanites, near urban, diverse families. What I thought was pretty interesting, um, Beyonce, and if you look at her draw, really throughout the city of Los Angeles, is is over indexing and outperforming the Taylor shows for lower Hispanic families. I don't know what the ticket prices were for these events. <laughs> it might be interesting to cross. Um, uh, far more boomers, right? Sunset boomers attending the Taylor Swift show, but far and then far more young professionals going to Beyonce's shows, right? Very interesting. Um, so getting a sense of, you know, who's attending the event just, I thought was a, a, a sort of a fun way to go. And I think this is some of the data that you would put together, Graham. How does Visit California um, implement strategy or build strategy based on these sorts of, uh, you know, um, family segments and household segments. Yeah. And again, it's new to us, but I think the opportunity here is really to, as we start to look at different types of events, whether festivals or different types of, of, of bands or um, different types of events, understand the consumer that's attending these, it can help shape, particularly in our own program, um, you know, customizing. I'm thinking, you know, as you mentioned, Taylor Swift had more of a, a boomer, maybe older suburban audience. Yeah. Um, well, we know those consumers are more likely to be on Facebook. So that might inform a Facebook strategy to better, you know, talk to talk to those consumers where Beyonce, more of a young urban, you know, single population. We know they're probably going to be on TikTok, Instagram. And so, you know, in terms of thinking about how to reach those consumers, that would be a better strategy. So 
um, you know, I think I think there's some insights here that we can really leverage to to better reach um, you know the type of visitors that would would consider coming to these shows and events. You know, I, I I wanted to ask David a similar question, which are David, considering you're doing youth sports outreach as well as adult sports, I know you have a number of events that I think you've got games and arcades, et cetera, that attract youth. Can you speak a little bit to some of the marketing strategies that you all are are implementing? Is it done by segment the way Grams is doing it? Like these folks are on TikTok, these folks are on Facebook. I mean, how, how do you tend to reach these audiences? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. We It is very segmented because the demographics for each sport is different. So we, uh, you know, for example, just hosted a great uh, event, a wheelchair basketball tournament, and it was veterans. Uh, and we had the first women's uh, uh-huh. national women's uh, win wheelchair basketball tournament here, and it was incredible. Uh, but the way we reach all those groups are really different depending on the segment. So that one was a lot of email marketing. It was a lot of us uh, reaching out to them directly. But we do. We have TikTok. Instagram is very big, especially, uh-huh. I would say, uh, for the athletes in volleyball and, uh, and, and basketball. And that matters to us. And what we learned was the more we can get those athletes engaged, like they're excited about coming to the facility that helps us just as much as marketing the experience to their parents on Facebook and in other ways that we might be doing media. Uh, so we really changed that strategy and we saw the benefit because that wasn't normal. I will say that wasn't normal for a lot of sports facilities to really be focusing on the athletes as much, but we we saw our numbers grow and our social media engagement grow when we started doing things to bring them in and all of the athlete, young athletes are on TikTok. So that's going to be obviously completely different when we do like the Harlem Globe, Globe Trotter, we're really marketing marketing more to the parents who are making that buying decision uh, for that. So that's going to be heavy Facebook. That's going to be heavy video and those type of things. Yeah. I put together a couple of um, ideas. We have a number of questions that have come in. I do want to address them, but I, I I think we have some time. So let me let me ask a couple of the quick questions that I put together because these came through our research um, in, in preparing for today. You know, I started out the conversation by talking about remote work, which is Every every economy, any central business district that had any you know significant office and workday population is taking a hit on the chin right now, right? It could be thirty percent of people are working three day weeks. It's forty percent, right, of a clip. So I'm curious about how these types of events that the David's Event Center is putting together, um, concerts and entertainment, are they starting to be you know since they have a, the, the potential to grow and these are massive growth industries can we start to sort of backfill a little bit into the local economy and and one of the ways i thought it would be fun to look at it um david is uh you know i was looking at total visitation to your center right sort of at, at the far left you'll see january 2019 right and gen- you can sort of see uh uh, the pandemic there kicking in January 2020. And it looks like you've actually resumed. And if you look on the far right of overall visitation, you're having a pretty strong growth. So I looked even more closely. And if what I can see is visitation to the Rocky Mountains Event Center, about 25% of it occurs not only during the week, right? Well, obviously, the tournaments are happening on the weekends, but about 25% of your visits are happening Monday through Friday. But if you look at the hours, and I was totally surprised to find this, most of it's happening between uh, before 3 p.m. So you're capturing a lot of people, I'm guessing, as part of their work day who are coming to visit you. Is that is that what you're is that what you're seeing? No, absolutely. Uh, we notice most of it happens at people during their work day. Uh, and 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 even the messages we get, the engagement, we get a lot of that happens during the day. And also part of what's happening with us is we also do a lot of corporate events. And so during the day as much, there's a ton of engagement for, because that's weekday business. That's really Monday through Thursday. And that's where we really focus heavy on to kind of fill the rest of the season. And we're seeing a whole lot more activity there that we're very steady. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just going to keep hammering this idea. I think that the, the sort of the, the new business economy is going to happen at places like Rocky Mount Event Center. I think that's part of the new professional sort of experience are these events and, and team building experiences and all that, which is part of this remote work life that we're all embracing so heavily. And it can also be leveraged, right? Remote work doesn't mean people have to be sitting in their in their houses, right? It means yep. that they're just not necessarily in the office, but it sounds like you can actually drive uh, a local economic uh, presence by workday activities, bringing people together. And Rocky Mountain is, is, is doing just that. So um, another ca- quick, quick question. Um, I was going to ask Graham for a sneak peek. I know that Visit California is going in through a bit of a 
through a bit of a, a an opportunistic transformation in terms of how messaging is occurring. But yeah, I'm going to table that for just a second because I think it's going to be good fun. I want to address some of these questions that have come in through the QA. So the first one, um, let's see, uh, corresponding to the weekend event. So Michael is asking a question. I'm guessing this is for you, David. It says uh, uh, he'd be interested to know which establishments experience the largest uptick in visitation uh, corresponding to your weekend events. Do you do you have a sense of that? Uh, David, do you have a, a sense of the which, which sort of which businesses in the Rocky Mount community are are just getting the most out of your events? Do, do you service either by category yeah. or who, who's uh, getting the most? Is it restaurants? Who's getting the most? Yeah. So the primarily, I would say who gets the absolute most are restaurants and lodging. Uh, they see it first. Um, the lodging I, I gives a ton of it. We we have actually a, the newspaper did a study earlier in the year and cited that our growth uh, was now like it was before the pandemic, that we had recovered and they used the Rocky Mountain Event yeah. Center as well as our outdoor sports complex as being key to that tourism growth. Uh, our restaurant and eateries have a ton of business that they would not have and they would not be seeing uh, the revenue numbers that they're seeing if it was not for the amount of business. But again, not just on the weekends during the week, because when there's corporate groups and the things you just spoke of come in town, a lot of them too, they go out, you know, they'll stay, they'll be here during the day and then they go out at night and, and uh, frequent a lot of our establishments in the community. Yeah. And, and again, I think, um, you know, just seeing those numbers that we looked at earlier for like, you know, Zaxby's and everything, it's just, it's undeniable, just like the, the massive impact that you're having. There's a follow-up question here from Robert, and I'm uh, Robert Whalen, um, forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Robert's question, and I, I wonder if, you know, I showed a number of slides that showed how um, that the attendees of these events tend to index at a higher income, median household income level than the mm -hmm. resident of the, of the city. So Robert's question, which I think is a pretty sensitive one, is he, he mentions that he's helping with the development of a youth sports center in a lower middle income area of Portland, Oregon. Um, just attracting affluent suburbanites is not appealing to what they're trying to accomplish there locally. Does Rocky Mount let kids of modest means uh, have access to the sports and the facilities uh, at some version of a discount or free? Or how are we how are we providing this amenity? to the local to the local population especially of kids uh great question and and absolutely we do that is a primary objective for our city leadership uh so the base of you know how the facility runs business wise is one thing but during the week especially and camps and we we just did a big community festival this past weekend there was free basketball hay rides free volleyball uh, some roller skating, as well as we open up the arcade. And so we we work with a lot of nonprofit groups, with schools, with organizations. During the summer, there's a ton of camps and field trips and the Boys and Girls Club and other programs uh, that come in the facility. And there's a completely different way in how we approach that. Uh, a lot of it is free. And even in our in many of our other facilities that the company runs, the city and counties will say, we have to give a report to them at the end of the year of how much community usage we allow the facility to have. That's wonderful. Yeah, no, I mean, I, and I understand just from a little bit of research and a little understanding I have of your company that that is a primary goal mm -hmm. is is benefiting the communities where where y'all are, are building these establishments. Um, uh, Jane asked a question, uh, an alternative to the thinking of, of Kanye's lens of Taylor versus Beyonce uh, would be to look at Wall Street Journal um, talking about the summer of 2023. Uh, Jane, take a look at the white papers on Placer's website that you can go access to it. We did a recent study that actually showed uh, the Barbie and Oppenheimer effect um, and, uh, you know, how different theaters are benefiting from just those events. So you're absolutely right. It wasn't limited to just those two concerts, but I, I focus on them because I know that's something that Graham was looking at. So Graham. I, well, and I just want to say that that I mean I think it's really interesting too just the yeah. the connections there because you have Taylor with one of the the biggest uh, uh, ticket selling movies in theaters right now with the documentary of her tour and you know and then her impact on NFL football I mean you look at twenty seven million million viewers turning into you know the the Chiefs games to the you know to watch uh, Travis Kelce and Taylor and that that uh, relationship unfold. So it's it's really interesting how connected some of these entertainment. Yeah, um, right. The Chiefs are benefiting. Are benefiting. Are benefiting. Connected. <laughs> yeah, the whole Taylor economy, right? I mean, it's just <laughs> it's a Taylor economy, exactly. Professional football. So, Graham, uh, you alluded the other day to the fact that Visit California, which is responsible for kind of nailing, maybe it's an annual message or however often you you guys sort of nail it. Um, 
is going through uh, a rethink a little bit specifically around this topic of entertainment and experience at a statewide level. Um, can you share, and I don't know if how much of it's sort of confidential or not ready for public consumption, but can you share a little bit about why experience and entertainment is now sort of at the core of what you're uh, sharing with the world about California? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if, if, if there's definitely a shift in in our in our branding. I mean, for a long time, our our brand platform was called Dream Big, and it was really, you know, the California lifestyle and you know a, a place that where anything's possible, a place where you can dream big. And during the the pandemic, we saw some tarnish on that. A number of reasons: political division in the country. We were going through significant wildfire seasons where San Francisco looked like it was on fire. We visit California it was dark during the pandemic in terms of our advertising. We spend between 50 and 60 million domestically. And so we've really shifted um, to a new platform. Uh, we're calling it the ultimate playground um, and really a focus on, on inspiring travelers to find playfulness in their life. It's not necessarily focused on live events, but it's really about uh, meeting the consumers where they are right now. Um, we know that while there are some political divisions within the country that people still find California, like everything we have to offer our abundance of, of travel opportunities, you know, great. And so, and then kind of finding the emotional connection where people are really in need of connection and play, um, finding joy. Um, and that's really kind of where we're going with this is that, um, everything that California has to offer, um, including, you know, live events like this, but, you know, really the, the whole travel offering, um, as well as the emotional connection to, to the California lifestyle, you know, the California culture and, and finding play in their lives. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I, and I don't know if you're already doing this. Um, and I, I know, I know visit California has access to statewide data, um, uh, via placer. And I'm curious if, if, if you're not already doing it, it, it just based on David's presentation and what, <laughs> what David's group is accomplishing. I mean, youth sports seems to be a massive draw for not, you know, for both inside the state and outside the state. I was just thinking, uh, thinking about that heat map that is showing the visitors on one weekend, you know, coming from Georgia, North Carolina, Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, like might be a pretty cool opportunity um, for, you know, maybe a little, little case study of how how youth youth sports and entertainment throughout California is a massive draw. A couple other questions from Jane just came in. Um, oh yeah, the Barbenheimer effect. Yeah, uh, for sure. And then I appreciate this, Jane, very much. So you're saying that this also speaks to the women's dollar uh, and economy. Really important to ensure we understand women's pocketbooks. Yeah, I think you know. I mean, obviously Taylor Swift and Beyonce are shining stars, uh, sort of above and beyond everyone. But I I do think that. Um, your point is right, which is, you know, it's it, it seems like um, the value of those two events, uh, I think, are outshining anything else that nothing else comes to mind. Right. And I guess even Barbie was was sort of similarly aligned. Um, I would just add that, too, in terms of Beyonce's tour. I mean, a lot of that impact was on small female owned women owned businesses, minority yeah. owned businesses, LGBTQ owned businesses. So. Um, you know, that, that was really an important impact from, from her tour. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's, a, that, that's a wonderful insight. Uh, you know, looking at where the visitors to those events and the attendees are spending, um, and, and sort of organizing it through that lens is, is a wonderful insight. I just want to be, uh, uh, courteous of everyone's time. There are five minutes, uh, remaining in the hour. Um, you know, uh, just, a, just a little bit of a thought, like it's, it's, it's not common or it's less common inside of one of these place webinars to have two experts that do such different things. Um, you know, and I, I, I really considered a lot, you know, not only different coasts, but literally sort of different roles and responsibilities around entertainment and economic impact. And that's why, it, you know, we sort of went in one direction, then went in another direction. It seemed like the right way to do it. Um, you know, many of the other webinars are much more sort of like interactive on a given topic, but I, I'm really glad that David's insights and Graham's insights were presented at the same time. And I, I really hope that this brought to light. I mean, look, we, you know, we can all look a lot at the sort of vanity stuff of like, oh, you know, how did the NBA playoffs do? And how did the Super Bowl do? And here come the win, you know, here come the Olympics to LA, get ready, Graham, you know, get those POIs in the system. But hearing David's insights from what 
uh, in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, with a population of 54,000 and an average household income of $45,000, you look at what a well-run, well-designed marketing operation and sports facility operation can do for the local economy. And it's just, it's just incredible. It's just incredible what those numbers look like. So uh, I, I just want to take an opportunity to both thank um, uh, 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 David, who joined us from Rocky Mount, uh, and obviously the work that his company, uh, sports facilities companies is doing across the country. I have a bunch more slides where I looked at what they're doing in really rural places like parts of Nartesia, New Mexico. And just again, similar, similar sort of hockey stick in terms of what the impacts look like, you know, even in places where you, you maybe just didn't expect it to have that much impact. And it does. Um, so thank you to David and thank you to Graham. Uh, I know you're a client of Placer and we really appreciate that and looking forward to partnering with you on this big strategy you're doing around uh, the 12 tourism economies in California. Um, but really just uh, uh, thanks also everyone for joining us, you know, having the ability to sort of look behind the curtain uh, of these events that we all spend so much time and so much energy to make them happen both locally, regionally and at the statewide level but to really see the impact they're having, how many people are coming to these events, how much money they're, they're spending in the local economy was, was the, the hope of this webinar. So again, it's a minute before the, the hour. I thank you all very much. Special thanks to our, our guests. We will make the video uh, available online at Placer.